Bulgaria and Romania were both members of the Axis in the Second World War, allied to the German war effort. Both countries, however, switched their allegiances as the war turned against the Axis, and by war's end, each found themselves under Soviet occupation. Both the United Kingdom and the United States recognized that these two nations were within the Soviet sphere of influence, giving Stalin the freedom to begin shaping the future of the two countries, in similar fashion to what he was doing with other nations under occupation by Soviet troops. I'm your host David, and this is The Cold War. So let's start by talking about Bulgaria. Despite being under the control of a military dictatorship during the war, Bulgaria was, for the most part, not a major military participant in the war. Keeping in mind that Bulgarians are an ethnically Slavic people who share a common ancestry, including language, with the Russians, waves of protests broke out across the country when Germany launched Operation Barbarossa in the summer of 1941. At the forefront of this opposition was the Fatherland Front, a loose coalition of anti-fascists with a strong communist membership. The Fatherland Front waged a guerrilla war against the government in Sofia, eventually successfully overthrowing the military dictatorship by September 2nd, 1944. Initially, the communists had only a minor role in government, but had started creating people's militias, which began persecuting supporters of the former regime, as well as non-communists. By June of 1945, Regent Prince Kirill, the members of the Regency Council, 22 former ministers, and many others had all been executed. Parliamentary elections were held in November of 1945, where the Fatherland Front, dominated by the Communists, won in a landslide, claiming 88% of the vote. Allegations of electoral fraud quickly followed, but were simply ignored. On the 8th of September 1946, a plebiscite was held regarding the abolishment of the Bulgarian monarchy. 95.6% of voters voted in favor of a republic, and the monarchy was abolished. In October of that same year, parliamentary elections were held again, run on the need to create a constitution for the new republic. The communists further consolidated their power amid widely recognized electoral fraud. Similar to what was happening in other Soviet-occupied countries, repression and elimination of opposition groups and non-communists followed. Georgi Dimitrov, who was the head of the Communist Party and had only returned from exile in the Soviet Union after the war had ended, became the Prime Minister, and he declared Bulgaria to be a People's Republic. The Agrarian Party, led by Nikola Petkov, remained in opposition to the Communists and aimed to preserve parliamentary democracy in the country. Their refusal to submit to the Communists led to acts of repression against them, and by June of 1947, Petkov had been arrested in Parliament and was subsequently sentenced to death on false charges of espionage. Although Western nations protested these charges, Petkov was executed on September 23, 1947. With his death, any remaining opposition in Bulgaria ceased to operate. A new constitution was subsequently adopted based on the Soviet Constitution of 1936, proclaiming a planned economy. Interestingly, the constitution did not ban private property, provided that private ownership of something was not considered against the public good. It also accepted fundamental civil and political rights for people, with the caveat that these rights could be suspended in situations that could threaten the achievements of the revolution. As I'm sure you can imagine, this left a great deal of room for interpretation for both what rights people had, as well as what private property could be held. Of course, the political sphere was not the only one where the process of Sovietization was taking place. The economic life of Bulgaria was also shifting. Under the Dimitrov government, agrarian reforms began to be enacted. 130,000 families received land as a result of a new government policy, which transferred land away from big landowners. This was a landmark event in a nation where 80% of the population were engaged in agriculture and helped to increase the support of the Communist Party. The death of Dimitrov in 1949 brought the Stalinist Volk Chernenkov to power, who almost immediately began to introduce policies leading toward mandatory collectivization. As part of the policies, anyone who opposed collectivization was imprisoned and sent to labor camps. At the height of the collectivization in Bulgaria, Upwards of 100,000 people were serving sentences 
in those labor camps. However, as a result of collectivization, productivity increased rapidly, especially as large-scale mechanization was introduced. Of course, agricultural transformation was only one half of that economic coin. There was also a campaign for the rapid industrialization of the nation, introduced by Chernenkov. Under his rule from 1950 to 1956, dozens of dams and hydroelectric power plants, chemical works, copper mines, and even the Alastite gold mine were established. The aim of this development was similar to other nations in Eastern Europe within the Soviet sphere of influence. All nations should be part of the industrial machine of the socialist world, preparing for the impending conflict with the capitalist West. So, now on to Romania. Romania, like Bulgaria and Hungary, was a member of the Axis powers. Romania was a monarchy led by King Michael I since 1940, but under the control of the military dictator Ion Antonescu. By August of 1944, realizing the war was going badly for the Axis, Michael threw his support behind the army and the communist-led underground opposition and removed Antonescu from power, declaring Romania for the Allies at almost the same time. Soon after, the nation was occupied by the advancing Red Army. The Soviet occupation forces pressured Michael, by March of 1945, to accept a government led by Petru Groza, leader of the Plowman Front, a leftist party strongly linked to the communists. This government appeared to be broad-based on paper, but in reality, Groza had named communists to his key ministries — interior, justice, propaganda, and economic affairs. The government did not even include any legitimate members of the National Peasant Party or the National Liberation Party. Instead, the communists had drafted dissidents from each of these parties, heralded them as the party's legitimate representatives, and then sidelined the genuine party leaders. For those of you who have watched our episodes on the Sovietization of other nations in Soviet-occupied Europe, this should all be starting to sound quite familiar. Almost immediately after taking office, Groza launched an agrarian reform program where landless peasants would receive free land expropriated from former Nazi collaborators or those owning over 50 hectares of land. In areas such as Transylvania, this resulted in almost the entire German population living there being stripped of their land. On the other hand, almost 800,000 Romanians received a parcel of land as a direct result of this reform. The Western Allies in 1945 considered the Soviet Union in violation of the agreements that had been made at Yalta that Moscow would not impose a communist government of any sort in their occupied states. Domestically, King Michael was also unhappy with the Groza government and protested by refusing to recognize it or sign any legislation or government decrees. The communists, however, just didn't care and went ahead with their plans without the king's signature. Anti-communist demonstrations in November of 1945 were met with force, resulting in dozens of casualties. In order to secure international recognition for his government, Groza made promises to not only improve the human rights record in Romania, but to also hold free elections. Both the United States and Great Britain, in a stunningly naive move with the advantage of hindsight, announced their recognition of the Groza government in February of 1946, before elections were held, and without any written guarantees from Groza. The West, if it intended to press for change, had just lost its most effective piece of leverage. Elections were held in 1946, but they were far from the free ones that were promised. The highlight of the election was that it was Romania's first elections with universal suffrage. The downside was that the results were highly disputed. By means of widespread ballot falsification, as well as persecution of opposition supporters, leftist parties, led by the communists, took 379 of the available 414 seats in the legislature. The National Peasant Party, the PNT, took 32 seats, while the National Liberals took a mere three seats. Internal reports from the Communist Party showed that the bloc of democratic parties, dominated by the communists, actually won less than 50% of the vote. Interestingly, the communists did much better in urban areas rather than the rural regions, despite agrarian reforms that had already been passed. It's claimed that this was because the majority of women in the rural areas voted for the PNT at the urging of the local priests. Famine and drought in rural areas also contributed to the weaker-than-anticipated communist support in those areas. 
The fraudulent election results and the strengthening communist grip on power created a need for anti-communist forces to rally together, which they did around the PNT. This of course led to the PNT becoming the main target for attacks by communist propaganda and the government. One of the PNT leaders, Ion Mihalake, a former officer in the military, formed the professional military circle to help oppose the communist-led domination. This led to the press accusing the PNT of being a fascist group with aims to overthrow the government. Communist politicians began to approach members of other parties with the goal of co-opting them, and they found some success with members of the PNT and the Socialist Peasant Party. Under continuous harassment, the PNT leadership, including Michalake, decided to leave the country to continue their resistance from abroad. On July 14, 1947, they were arrested at Tamadao Airfield outside of Bucharest, and arrested on charges of treason and attempting to set up a government in exile. They were sentenced to harsh prison terms in the labor camps. As a result of the so-called Tamadao affair, rounds of repressions began. The parliamentary immunity held by PNT members of parliament was stripped away and the PNT was banned. The leader of the non-communist faction of the Social Democratic Party, Constantin Petrescu, was arrested and sentenced to prison. The leader of the opposition National Liberal Party was fired from his post as the foreign minister. The majority of anti-communist politicians at this point were either arrested or forced into exile and the Social Democrats were forced to merge with the communists, creating the Romanian Workers' Party. On December 30th, 1947, King Michael I was forced at gunpoint to abdicate as king after his palace was surrounded by troops loyal to the communist government. Later that same day, the monarchy was officially abolished and the Romanian People's Republic was proclaimed. In the first week of January of 1948, Michael I and his family were forced into exile and he would not return for 43 years until after the fall of communism. 1948 saw the adoption of a new constitution in Romania based on, yep, you guessed it, the 1936 Soviet constitution. The new constitution did not prohibit private enterprise, but it did emphasize the importance of state property and the duty of citizens to increase it. The principle of a guided and planned national economy were introduced, while both domestic and foreign trade was regulated and controlled by the state. The constitution reserved ultimate authority with the Workers' Party. Now, like in Bulgaria, at the same time as the political scene was being transformed in Romania, a rapid economic transformation was also taking place. Like in other Eastern European nations, preference was being given to heavy industry over lighter consumer goods. A number of joint Romanian-Soviet ventures were established on a half-share basis, where each nation would receive half of what was produced. These sovroms were set up in such fields as oil, gas, transport, banking, wood processing, coal, and the chemical industry, as well as in the cultural field of cinematography. Romania was also a producer of uranium, which was exported to the Soviet Union to be used in Stalin's nuclear projects. By 1952, a full 85% of Romanian exports were directed to the Soviet Union, with the total value of goods being sent by Romania being in excess of $2 billion. This far exceeded the amount of war reparations that had been demanded by the Soviet Union from Romania. It's claimed that Romania suffered significantly from the unfavorable conditions imposed by the Sovroms, as well as how they were managed by the Soviet Union. So what was the effect of all this? Well, to be honest, it wasn't good. The combination of war reparations, poor economic management, and the devaluation of the Romanian currency coincided with a severe drought and outbreaks of famine resulted. In 1949, this led to a movement for the collectivization of agriculture. Despite a massive propaganda campaign encouraging peasants to accept this movement, it wasn't enough, with up to 50,000 people being imprisoned for their opposition to the collectivization movement. The party would only declare the complete collectivization of Romania in 1962. So, as you can see, the process of Sovietization in Bulgaria and Romania was quite similar, and followed the same trajectory as other Eastern European nations in the immediate post-war period. The Communist parties were able to dominate the political scene by means of fraudulent elections, the control of key ministries, effective propaganda machines, and the coercion of opposition parties, 
all with help from Soviet influence. Industrialization and collectivization campaigns were carried out in both countries. Both also refused assistance from the US-led Marshall Plan, thanks to pressure from the Soviet Union. The Western Allies, wanting to avoid direct confrontation with the Soviet Union, largely turned a blind eye to the Sovietization process, leaving Bulgaria and Romania under the control of the Soviet Union until the eventual collapse of communism in 1989. We'll discuss all of this in future videos, so make sure you're subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We rely on our patrons to create these videos, so consider supporting us via www.patreon.com slash the Cold War. This is the Cold War channel and we will catch you on the next one.